CEE Central Europe Explained An IDM podcast series powered by Erste Group Episode 45 Thrill or Chill Dog Tourism in Central Eastern Europe For most people, holidays means a week at the beach, a visit to the famous Eiffel Tower, or eating the world's best pizza in Naples. But that's not the first things coming up in everyone's mind. Some people seek the thrill, the misery. They visit places of previous genocide, natural and man-made catastrophes, and former war zones. Places of which Central, East and Southeast Europe have plenty, given the region's specific historical, cultural and political context. Dog tourism describes these practices of traveling to places of human suffering. But why visiting a concentration camp when you could spend your holiday hiking in the mountains? This episode tries to shed light on the motivations for visiting these extraordinary sites and how to deal with misery in a respectful manner. Where to draw the line between commemoration and exploitation? Is dark tourism a way of agency over one's own past? And when and where does it lead to propaganda-driven narratives? Welcome to CEE, Central Europe Explained. My name is Melanie Jandl and with me today is Peter Hohenhaus. Hohenhaus has visited about 1000 dark tourism sites in about 100 countries. He runs a blog and website where he shares his experiences of traveling the unconventional way, which he also put down in his book Atlas of Dark Destinations. Hello, Mr. Hohenhaus, and thank you for being our guest today. My pleasure. Mr. Hohenhaus, most people go on vacation to relax from their exhausting daily routines and to discover the beauties of other cultures. Dark tourism goes in a quite different direction, looking at past tragedies and examples of the lowest points in the history of mankind. What draws you to these dark sites? Quite simply, I find them more interesting than the standard tourist attractions prescribed by mainstream guidebooks. And it's also, it's closer to my heart because it deals with modern history and I find it much more relatable to than ancient histories of like Roman uh, sites or so leave me pretty cold. It's too far away from my own biography. So I relate to more recent things, more in particular, for example, Cold War sites. I'm, I'm that kind of generation who came of age at the height of the Cold War in the early 80s. So that's something I'm keen to explore, especially sites that you couldn't go to at all at the time, and now you can. It is true, though, that dark tourism is the, what I would say, the antithesis to escapism. You know, instead of forgetting about the world and all its woes, it's tackling them straight on. The point of doing so is not to revel in the darkness, though that's sometimes an accusation that comes up, but it's rather the opposite, I mean, bringing the darkness to light, in particular for oneself. I always say it's something that just broadens your horizons so much, and so it's educational, like most other travel. And there's the element of what's been called place authenticity. It does really make a difference whether you're standing at a place where something historically significant has happened compared to just reading about it at home. That's the, the sort of the extra bonus you get out of doing dark, dark tourism, I find. And just maybe to um, add to this, so when you plan your holidays or when mm. your wife comes to you and is mm. like, oh, let's go there. Is it the first thing you're doing, doing research about what sites, what dark tourism sites can I um, look at there? It has developed uh, into exactly that. Um, when I first heard about the existence of the term dark tourism, I discovered that I had long been, all my life I've been a dark tourist. I just didn't know the term existed. That applies to most dark tourists. Most people are still unaware of the existence of the term because it's an academic term and you don't encounter it much unless you stumble upon it in the, in the media. And when I first read about it and uh, the examples quoted there, I was saying, hey, I've been there, I've been there, I've been there. I must be a dark tourist. And it was at a time when I did my first completely independently planned longer trip that was to Turkey in 2007. And I had one particular website that helped me a lot doing that. And I thought, why doesn't something like that exist for dark tourism? I looked a bit around and didn't find really much. And I thought, well, I'll have to do it myself then. And 
totally underestimated the scale of the task. I said, oh, I'll make a hundred pages and so on. And after a thousand pages, I stopped counting and that was 10 years ago. So I don't know how many 10,000 pages it is now. So it is, has become, so it's taken over my life and certainly my traveling life. I do indeed select countries by what can they do for dark tourism. Also with a view, I view it not so much as a holiday, but as a, as field trips for research for my, my website. That said, though, um, I always try to combine things. I always like, want to work in non-dark things uh, into trips. Nobody, not even me, can do just 100% dark. That would be too much. You need a counterpoint. So, but it has, um, it is indeed so that I select the countries I travel to and the places inside these countries according to what I can find in terms of dark tourism. That is indeed the case. That's totally unrepresentative, of course. Most dark tourists do a little bit of dark tourism and then other things as well, but not so committedly. <laughs> We talked before we started the recording a little bit and uh, as you told, you uh, visited about 100 countries, especially mm. also in Europe and um, East and Southeast Europe, the um, regions we are also focusing mm. on here at the IDM, offer quite many sites for people interested in dark tourism. Mm. They are related to the Holocaust, to Cold War, communism, civil wars, national struggles and so on. To just name some of the most famous sites, there is the former concentration camp Auschwitz in Poland, mm -hmm. um, the ghost town of Pripyat in Ukraine, mm -hmm. where the Chernobyl nuclear disaster took place, and the remains of the Berlin Wall in Germany. Few as they are. <laughs> <laughs> what sites in the region have left the most striking impressions to you and why? Um, one of those you just mentioned, namely Pripyat or the Chernobyl exclusion zone uh, itself. And I've been three times, and even quite early on, 2006 was my first trip, when it was very niche. And then 2015, when numbers were already swelling up, and the last time was in November 2018, in winter, first snow that added to the atmospheric place. What I find so unique about it is has this element of time travel in both directions simultaneously. On the one hand, you get this time travel back to the Soviet era when the place was built and when the disaster happened. At the same time, though, it is a glimpse into a dystopian post-civilization future, what a world will look like everywhere once humanity is gone and nature reclaims our concrete structures. And having this at the same time is something that I haven't really encountered much elsewhere, maybe Pyramiden and Svalbard, but... Um, Chernobyl is really unique also for the scale of the whole thing. Most people just go on these short coach trips and that really isn't enough. People who really get into the topic usually do multi-day tours. Although I have to put it all in the past tense, of course, at the moment, because tourism in Chernobyl doesn't take place at the moment, of course. And we, who knows when it will resume. But I still would still name it my number one. So I also found that a bit of a personal blow. <laughs> and suddenly Chernobyl was in this war. Um, Otherwise, yeah, you named the, the classic ones in, in, in Poland, but it's not just Auschwitz, there's also, I found Majdanek even more impressive. And then there's Sobibor and these other um, Operation Reinhardt camps that are extremely dark. Um, but since we're here in a Danube-oriented institute, how about going on a little dark tourism river cruise starting here in Vienna? Um, where I would pick the one that is actually closest to the river, that's the so-called Cemetery of the Nameless, where until the 1940s, corpses were washed ashore and were given a decent burial. And most of them were, of course, not identified, hence the name, the nameless. A few are identified, though. And then you go a bit down river, you come to Bratislava with its iron curtain and relics either side of the river. They're quite interesting to explore. Next down is Budapest. We might come back to that. And then where the Danube forms the border between Croatia and Serbia, you get Vukovar on the Slavonian side. And that is the place in the whole Balkans where I found that this legacy of the war that accompanied the breakup of Yugoslavia is the most palpable. There are scores of sites and there's lots of war ruins even still in place. So that is an, uh, a grim and quite recent uh, dark place on the Danube. And then you eventually get to Belgrade, which is has more recent things like the bombing scars from 99, but also lesser known concentration camp relics like Saimistir and Banditsa, and a very controversial military museum that we might also come back to. 
So when you visit dark tourism locations, there is two ways of doing it. You either like plan it before and you go there, mm. or you reach out to people there. Some maybe offer some kind of like mm. unofficial tours yeah. or stuff like that, or even official tours. Yeah. But all those historical sites, especially those related to human tragedies, mm -hmm can be exploited for any regime's propaganda, right? Mm -hmm. So have you experienced anything alike yet? Yes, uh, it, it does ha uh, happen less so in Europe, although in some Eastern places more so. Um, one example I could quote is the, like actually applies to all the Baltic states and their, their contemporary history museums. They have this very strong anti-Soviet narrative all the way through and the uh, most striking example is in Vilnius, with the what was called the Museum of Genocide Victims. And when you hear that name, you think genocide in Lithuania must mean the Holocaust, where it was particularly vicious. But when I visited the museum, I found out that's not at all the case. What they're referring to is the two Soviet occupations, the one at the beginning of World War II, and then the one following after the, the Red Army drove the Nazis out. And so the term genocide refers not to actual genocide, but to the deportations in the Stalin era, which were like political purges, but not genocide. Whereas the Holocaust definitely was. It's the prime example of, of genocide. And that is only getting a little side note in this museum. And I guess the reason that in recent years it has been renamed Museum of Occupations and Freedom Fights, like its counterparts in the other two Baltic states, is probably a reaction to criticisms like this that must have been brought forward by other people too. So they reacted by changing the name though not the narrative. <laughs> I think we have that in many countries, mm. uh, also in our target region, that mm. especially those that are scarred by civil wars. So also if you look to Croatia. the Balkans, you go yeah. to museums or you go, mm. you could even look at the history school book probably yeah. and different yeah. narratives are yeah. told. Yeah, Croatia is an example. You get like, in, in Vukovar, for example, you get like this extremely anti-Serbian stance in all of them. So yeah, and especially these recent ones, uh, where it is, you can feel it's still alive, the conflict isn't quite over. It's a bit like in Northern Ireland, the troubles are officially over, but you still feel it simmering. And obviously in the Balkans, that's also the case, especially in Bosnia, actually. What responsibilities would you say do the people who actually profit mm. from those dark tourism sites if it's mm. museums yeah. if it's like um commemoration yeah. places yeah. um or even tour operators yeah. what yeah. responsibilities do they have in showcasing those yeah. sites well the, what they should do is uh strive for as balanced a uh, presentation as possible but that seems to be not always the main aim you are right that often there seems to be a pre-given propagandistic narrative that's in the foreground and the rest has to fit in. Um, so some countries are better at that than others. And sometimes you think like, oh, this is a bit complicated. Will they get it right? I'm thinking of the recent, recently opened museum of, of displacement and, and flight in Berlin, um, which was much more controversial before it actually came into existence than since, because they actually struck a very good balance, I found overall. So I, I was quite impressed with it. I, I went there with my doubts, but they were swept aside, so they did a good job. Elsewhere, you sometimes get, yeah, um, an example I could quote from Serbia is the Military Museum in Belgrade, where the uh, 1999 NATO intervention is predictably portrayed as just total aggression. The context of Kosovo is not even mentioned. Kosovo doesn't get a mention at all in it. So um, that's obviously very one-sided. And then they complain about um, the use of cluster bombs, which is banned. So but they failed to note that the convention that banned them was 10 years after the 99 war. So you can't claim that every condition has been broken. Um, a bit of things like that. So you can see like where the point is. And I mean, I'm not saying that the, the bombings of the grave were were a good thing. That's it's, It is very controversial. But withholding the context of it is, of course, an example of the museum curators not having lived up to their responsibility. And that's why I always say in dark tourism, the main responsibility lies with the dark tourists. You don't stumble into places like that unprepared. You have to do your homework before you go. And then you can't fall for these things if you already know the context. There is definitely the need for a certain um, 
amount of sensitivity when uh, visiting those mm. sites related mm. to human yeah. Um, yeah. tragedies. And in this regard, we see a lot of inappropriate behavior, I guess, too. And I wanted to not ask... Long, not so much, but it does happen, yeah. yeah. Can um, you name some examples? Yeah, uh, the probably the most drastic example I encountered it was quite a while ago in 2008 in Poland at the Stutthof concentration camp memorial near Gdansk. Um, it just so happened that it was in the summer, in August, but it was a grey, dull day. Now, Stutthof is not far from the beach, and there's a lot of domestic tourism there. And I presume that lots of people ask, well, this is not a beach day, this is a museum day. Looked at the map, said, oh, Stutthof State Museum, let's go there. So that was what I would say as accidental duck tourists, and it showed. Um, for, to begin with, they, there's a sign by the entrance saying um, not suitable for under 14 year olds. But these beach tourists that came there with whole families with little children, babies even. So you got like these odd things, like two buggies parked outside the crematorium. <laughs> it's just not, not in, the, in the sense of the, the curators. And then the, the snapshot taking. That was before smartphones took over, so it wasn't selfies, but little compact cameras. And I remember one particular case of a mother placing her daughter in front of everything, the, the gas chamber, the crematoria, the execution site in the forest, and the daughter, possibly like 12 years old, so I sensed was very uncomfortable with it, whereas the mother didn't have any such sensitivity. And so this does happen, but it's usually people, as I said, who stumbled into a dark room site without having done this preparation and without having this awareness. And it's got worse with the dominance of selfies so that's come about over the last decade or so. And that has often brought dark tourism in a, in a bad light in the, in the media. Although I would say the problem is a general one you can't blame dark tourism for. And I think it's worse outside dark tourism than within. But it is an issue and it really is the case that I always advise people, dark tourism and selfies just don't go together. Just don't do it. If you do dark tourism, it's not about you. You don't push yourself in the foreground. Be restrained and certainly don't do these standard selfie or um, like grinning or pouting selfies. But for some people, it's become so automatic, such a reflex, that they've lost the awareness of when it's appropriate or not. Are you familiar with the art project Yolocost? Yes, yes. yeah, I've, I've seen the... Yeah. the, the I the, found it's interesting just for the listeners. Um, it was a project where um, selfies in front of the Holocaust Memorial mm. in Berlin, but mm. also concentration camps throughout mm. Europe yeah. um, were edited to put the people on the selfies in the background of actual the victims the pictures, yeah. of the Holocaust. And... Um, it actually received, even from the people depicted, yeah. quite good resonance, and yeah. they said... But also criticism. Mm -hmm. Definitely criticism, mm -hmm. yes. But I, for me, I mean, a lot of people were really only then, like, realizing and embarrassed yeah. about what they yeah. did, and they were actually yeah. contacting the artist, uh, Shahak yeah. Shapira, if I'm not wrong, yeah. telling him, thanks for calling me out, and... Yeah. I had a recent case like that. Um, a fellow blogger uh, contacted me and wanted some, some links inserted, in the, and, some, and it was about Auschwitz. And I saw his blog, and he did have a picture of himself in front of the gatehouse of Auschwitz-Birkenau. I, I wrote back to him and said, I'm sure it's not intentional, but it just does look disrespectful. And he instantly reacted, so thanks for pointing out to me and changed the photo to one without him in it. Um, but I do think that even though it does look uh, disrespectful you should do it I don't think it's actually intentional people just lack the sensitivity so you have a blog and your your book where you more or less point people to those mm. dark tourism mm. sites do you also see your responsibility in educating them about the appropriate behavior at those sites yeah um, I do I have a chapter about that and about ethical issues in general on the website and wherever it is a particular issue I'll link to it. Uh, in general I presume that if anybody reads in depth on my side probably doesn't need that education anymore. They will be aware of the nature of dark tourism. So I don't dwell on it on every single case. I presume that by reading my website you are actually doing your homework and then uh, people will be aware of. And was it for yourself also something that was a learning in progress so to say so the more sites you traveled um the more you became aware of what is mm. 
like prop appropriate behavior mm -hmm. and what is not? Or have you also experienced the feeling that you are crossing a line at any dark tourism sites? Um, I've often been asked that and I now I think hard and I can't really find an answer. I do try to be discreet and respectful and always have done. So the only kind of crossing of lines that you could accuse me of is that I occasionally ignored no trespassing signs and entered buildings that I shouldn't have. But I've, I've never broken into anywhere and uh, I do not want to uh, promote illegal uh, behavior on my website. So I normally uh, stay away from that for myself. Um, but of course, there are controversial issues that come up and you have to ask, yourself, do I really want to do that? Do I not want to do that? And one example happened to me in uh, South Africa when I visited Soweto Township, um, mainly to see some sites um, related to the Nelson Mandela um, legacy. And then my driver guide suggested, shall we go on a township tour with some of the locals? And I hesitated and eventually declined politely because that would fall under what's been called slum tourism. And I'm very uncomfortable with that. And I don't even think it's part of dark tourism. Some people say it is, mostly in order to then slag off dark tourism as voyeuristic. And indeed, I think uh, slum tourism has a voyeuristic element because it is looking at ongoing misery and poverty, whereas the rest of dark tourism proper looks at dark pasts looks at history and I think that's a fundamental difference and apart from that it just isn't for me I just I would just feel uncomfortable also you mentioned that you um, have been in Pripyat I assume giving the radioactive atmosphere there and everything it counts maybe to one of the dark tourism sites that also pose a little bit of danger maybe that's also happening when you say you you're um, trespassing somewhere, although you shouldn't. So have there ever been like situations that have been dangerous where you felt yourself endangered in the situation? Um, not very often. And uh, they were usually not directly related to dark tourism. But since you uh, mentioned Pripyat, um, this is another case point where you, you do your, uh, your homework and understand radiation and then you see that most of the zone is perfectly fine. It's a, it's a matter of how much time you spend where and there are a few hot spots where you shouldn't linger too long but um, uh, Chernobyl town itself has a lower atmospheric background radiation than Kiev or Frankfurt or Vienna so it's perfectly so Many parts of the zone could be reopened theoretically but then there are these hot spots and you have to, to know how to behave there and not spend too much time. So, yeah, a risk assessment is, is something. And as some people have pointed out, the greatest risk in Pripyat is the instability of the buildings after so many decades of crumbling. And so when tourism was still possible in the, the sort of up to uh, yeah, 2019, the, a rule had been imposed that tourists were no longer allowed to enter buildings. We still did in 2018, and it is one of the attractions visiting for example the hospital and seeing this abandonment it's 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 photogenic and it's it's yeah has a certain element of adventure in it but um this is not sustainable it was never because some buildings have already collapsed so that what well, the last thing they want is like a group of tourists being crushed by a collapsing building so yeah that's that's also the change over time i mean uh, in 2006 it wouldn't have been such an issue and then few decades on <laughs> that's what i was just about yeah. to ask is yeah. there also like a best before date so to say about dark tourism sites? i remember i remember Will that with fade? chernobyl i was um i was in touch with many people who'd been there and were really dedicated repeat uh, visitors and then there was one photo posted online um of five or six coaches out parked outside the checkpoint waiting to be processed and somebody just uh, commented, it's over. <laughs> this is now mass tourism. Mm -hmm. So some people complained that this was going in the direction of over tourism. And indeed, the um, the Ukrainian authorities were pushing it. Uh, they realized that this is possibly our number one tourist site now with all this international attention. And there was also help by this uh, series. Um, but of course, at the moment, that's all history. And also when it comes to buildings or monuments mm. collapsing, yeah, right? Because some of them, uh, I know there, I forgot the name about it, this, uh, uh, was it the headquarter, um, the mm. communist headquarter Buzlucha? in Bulgaria? Buzlucha. Yes, yes. Yeah, Where uh, I heard it's really dangerous yeah. to actually enter already. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, no, longer, it's no longer possible. It's no, they now have guards and CCTV cameras and so on. Um, you can't really get in anymore. And I mean, I've... 
I visited the place in, what was it, 2010, I think, and it was still possible to go in, but it was already a bit dicey. Um, my guide and my wife waited outside while I crumbled in. I had to do a bit of climbing as well, so they said, no, we're not getting ourselves dirty. And it was in spring, and uh, there was still ice and snow inside, and I saw all these bits that had fallen from the ceiling, and I sort of tre was treading very carefully, and I put a hat on, <laughs> and... Uh, was just aware of my surroundings. And of course it has to deteriorate a lot since, and now it would be really, really dangerous. So people, officials who go in, they have hard hats on and uh, really take take care. And there's this, this project of restoring the place. Let's see whether it will happen. I've, I'd, I'd hope so, because it is, it's a unique relic mm -hmm. of a time that in Bulgaria is a bit yeah, soft swept under the rug. They don't want to talk about communism anymore. Mm -hmm. So um, we come to the end of our podcast mm. and at the end of our podcast we always um, ask our guests to recommend a piece of art related to the topic. Mm. What did you bring for our listeners? I picked a sculpture of sorts, a monument by the banks of the Danube in Budapest. It's a series of replica shoes made of metal, sort of rusty brown metal, but they look very realistic and they're set into the, the quayside and it's called Shot into the Danube. And it's a reference to the Holocaust. When it arrived very late in Hungary in 1944, when Hitler decided to invade, and that let loose Hungary's own Nazis, the Arrow Cross, who then went on a rampage killing Jews, including lining them up at the Danube, ordering them to take off their shoes, because shoes were a valuable commodity, and then shooting them into the river so that the current would wash the, the corpses away. This is the reference, but most people don't get it to just find these shoes and it is intriguing and aesthetically appealing and it doesn't help that the plaque that gives a reference to what it what it is actually about is set into the pavement several meters away too easy to miss and when i was there lots of people were taking selfies and photos there and i had to wait a long time to get the opportunity to get a frame without people to photograph this monument and it is as i would say it's an example of beauty and tragedy but beautiful that nonetheless is. Thank you for this tip and thank you very much for the insights of this whole um, podcast episode that maybe inspired the one or the other listener today for the next vacation, for the next trip. Um, I would definitely also recommend everyone to check out the we website. We will link it in our podcast description or also um, get the book Atlas of Dark Destinations if you're interested in traveling to those historical very important sites i would say and thank you for equipping our audience with knowledge about the proper behavior at those sites my pleasure thank you thank you very much this was cee central europe explained a podcast series produced by the institute for the danube region and central europe if you enjoyed listening to us Make sure to subscribe to the IDM podcast series on your favorite podcast platform. Additionally, you can explore our other work on our website www.idm.at. If you have any feedback or if you're interested in collaborating on a podcast episode, please do not hesitate to contact us through our social media channels at IDM Vienna or write us an email to IDM at idm.at IDM Podcast Institut für den Donauraum und Mitteleuropa Institute for the Danube Region and Central Europe European Perspectives Regional Actions Cooperation and Expertise since 1953